Hello and welcome again. Before we go into the advanced study of the topic of photosynthesis, which is required in IB Biology HL, let's take some time to review the basics from the core and from your previous knowledge of biology. And most students will be quite familiar, of course, with this very important process of photosynthesis. Photo meaning light, synthesis referring to the manufacture or the building up of something using carbon dioxide from the air, water from the soil, sunlight energy, and harnessing all of those raw materials inside of the leaf, specifically in the chloroplast. Green plants are able to manufacture glucose and release oxygen, the waste product of photosynthesis. Is this not sufficient for us to understand that plants can grow well if they get water, if they get light, if they get carbon dioxide? And the reason for going beyond this is to understand exactly how plants manufacture glucose using these raw materials. And if we could do that, then it could be possible to create something of an artificial leaf, if you will, and to carry out what is called a global artificial photosynthesis. The GAP project, which is ongoing right now, seeks to do exactly this. Now, it's not groundbreaking, really, because we've already got something called the solar cell. The solar cell can convert light energy into electrical energy. And we've already got something called the electrolysis of water, where electrical energy could be used to split water into hydrogen and oxygen. So combining those two, as I have in this model here, you can see the beginnings of the artificial leaf where light energy is used for the photolysis of water. But what is this photolysis of water? And where does it even come into this equation, you might ask? And that, of course, is why we need to go in and take a closer look. Let's start by getting some perspective. Here we have a leaf, and this is a transverse section of the leaf, cutting the section this way and looking in this direction. Then if we zoom in on one individual cell of that leaf, this cell here from the palisade mesophyll might be a good one to look at because in the palisade mesophyll you have lots of these little green structures. They are the chloroplasts and inside of the chloroplast you've got the fluid filled area called the stroma and then you've got these flattened discs which together make up the grana or the grana and each one of those stacks, when you zoom in on it, is referred to as a thylakoid. And the thylakoid and the membrane that surrounds it is going to be our main focus. And here we see the grana with here a single thylakoid with the membrane, a double membrane going around. If we were to zoom in into that membrane, it would look something like this with these systems running through your typical fluid mosaic structure. These systems are made up of lots of chlorophyll molecules. This particular one is referred to as photosystem 2. We start off with photosystem 2 because it was the second of two photosystems to be discovered, but it's actually a good starting point to describe the process of photosynthesis, but the name Photosystem 2 has remained. Photosystem 2 can also be described as an enzyme because it's very much catalyzing or assisting in the splitting of water. The photolysis of water is not simply about exposing water to sunlight and expecting it to split into hydrogen and oxygen. That doesn't happen. Something needs to be present to catalyze and to make that process happen. And that catalyst is very much this group of molecules here, this group of chlorophyll molecules that make up photosystem 2. 
So therefore, it's not surprising that in this research paper, Photosystem 2 is referred to as the water-splitting enzyme of photosynthesis. Light, photons of light, tiny packets of light, strike chlorophyll molecules in Photosystem 2. Photosystem 2, a bunch of chlorophyll molecules that are stacked together in here. Once that light hits it, electrons are excited from the ground state to a higher energy level. Then the chlorophyll molecules become electron deficient. They have a greater tendency to pull electrons toward themselves. And if something is going to attract electrons to itself, it's going to gain electrons, then it's going to become reduced. So chlorophyll is going to want to get electrons to become reduced. And where is it going to get those electrons from? Those electrons come from the spontaneous splitting of the nearby water molecules, which are then providing the electrons to this oxidizing agent, which in itself becomes reduced. So photosystem 2 is accepting those electrons, causing the splitting of a water molecule into oxygen and two hydrogen ions. This oxygen is being produced inside of the thylakoid here. And the hydrogen ions are also being produced inside of the thylakoid. The oxygen ultimately diffuses out of the system and out through the stoma of the leaves into the atmosphere. It is a waste product of photosynthesis and once it's produced at this stage, there's no more part for oxygen to play in this complicated series of events. But what happens next? Electrons are excited, hydrogen ions are produced, oxygen is produced. How does this lead to the building up of glucose? And the answer to that question comes by considering this diagram. Again, we need some perspective. We are looking here at a single membrane inside of a thylakoid. This is the inside of the thylakoid, the lumen, the space inside of the thylakoid. Outside of it, you've got the fluid-filled, the liquid-filled stroma. So, with electrons being excited, and here is where you have a misconception arising, confusion arising because of different textbooks that students use. In this particular source, which is an open access, free to use textbook, one electron is shown being excited to a higher energy level. And of course, the balanced equation shows half O2 and 2H+. If you are going to get 2H+, it stands to reason that you will need two electrons to be lost. But here only one electron is shown. So you should take a note of that to avoid any confusion. Other sources would sometimes show 2H2O so that they remove this half and make it into a whole number to allow the stoichiometry or the balanced equation to not have a fraction. So with all of that in mind, let's look at what happens to this one electron as it goes from the ground state to the excited state and that is coupled to the photolysis of water. Then the electron gets passed through a series of acceptors. These acceptors, what are they really? They are transmembrane proteins, as you can see here. Electrons go from chlorophyll to acceptor 1, acceptor 2, acceptor 3. Each acceptor gaining electrons because they have a greater affinity than the preceding acceptor. As these electrons are passed, though, energy is released. The process is exergonic, and that free energy that is released is harnessed to allow hydrogen ions to go against a concentration gradient and to be brought into the thylakoid lumen by active transport. So there's going to be a buildup in here of hydrogen ions. Eventually, photosystem 1 comes into the picture, and photosystem 1 also gets excited by photons of light. But the photon that excites photosystem 1 is of a slightly different wavelength and frequency to the one that excites photosystem 2. 
But electrons do go from the ground state to the excited state, and the electron that is coming down this chain of acceptors eventually comes to fill in the missing space in photosystem 1. And then the electron from photosystem 1 gets passed to this final acceptor here, the redoxin, which in turn passes its electron outside of the thylakoid into the stroma so that it can be accepted by NADP positive and an H+. Two electrons, of course, are needed here, but only one is shown in the diagram. Remember I mentioned that two electrons would be liberated here because we've got two H+. So think about these two electrons then coming here to allow NADPH to be formed. This is referred to in the textbooks as reduced NADP. Of course, because it's gained hydrogen, it's gained an electron. Reduction is gain. So reduced NADP is produced. The purpose of this will become clear later. Meanwhile, all of this hydrogen that's built up inside of the thylakoid lumen is now at a very high concentration. And then it will exit this lumen by going through this transmembrane protein, which again is really an enzyme, an enzyme called ATP synthase. And as these hydrogen ions flow through this transmembrane protein, the process releases enough energy to allow this chemical reaction to be powered. And then ATP, the energy-rich molecule, adenosine triphosphate, is built up. So you've got two important products coming out of this thylakoid lumen into the stroma. Once this light-dependent reaction is completed, and they are NADPH, also known as reduced NADP, and ATP. And now the focus turns to outside of the chloroplast, to this space known as the stroma. And the reduced NADP, or NADPH, and ATP are now free to be used in another series of reactions. These reactions are sometimes referred to as the Calvin cycle, named for Melvin Calvin, who first discovered it. Once inside of the stroma, carbon dioxide that is diffusing into the leaf from the underside and entering into the cells by diffusion, that carbon dioxide combines with a five-carbon structure called ribulose bisphosphate, and in the presence of the enzyme ribulose bisphosphate carboxylase, RUBP combines with CO2 to form a six-carbon structure which very quickly degenerates into two three-carbon structures. That three-carbon structure in the presence of ATP and NADPH forms a three-carbon phosphate. That three-carbon phosphate then goes through a series of steps which we won't go into to build up glucose, starch, cellulose, and all of the components of the plant. Some of it is used to regenerate the 5-carbon structure, RUBP, to allow the Calvin cycle to continue to rotate. This part of the process is also known as the light-independent reaction because no light is needed for this component to happen. Light is needed for the photolysis of water and for the excitation of the chlorophyll molecule. That's the light-dependent reaction. This component, the light-independent reaction. And now that we've completed all of those discussions, I would like you to revisit all of the required understandings in our biology course. And you can see them here. Then I would like you to relate all of those understandings, to use them to answer this question, which is to explain why this summary equation for photosynthesis given here is a gross oversimplification. I want you to do that in about 500 to 600 words and to include a few diagrams as required.